In the northern Rockies, at the hub of five river valleys, lies the city of Missoula, Montana, and the communities of Bonner and Milltown. Roughly 75,000 people live, work, and play in this Clark Fork River corridor. They also share an enormous problem, contaminated sediments that seep into the drinking water and periodically wash down the river and kill fish. These toxic waste are trapped behind the Milltown Dam, next door to Bonner and Milltown, and just eight miles upstream from Missoula. For nearly 100 years, the dam has plugged the Clark Fork and Blackfoot rivers. At the turn of the last century, it powered nearby sawmills and helped fuel Butte's massive copper mines. But it also trapped a lot of mining waste. And Milltown Dam uh, was constructed in 1907, and it got its first uh, big test very shortly thereafter in 1908, when the biggest flood on record came down the Clark Fork. Of course, that moved all of those sediments down the river um, deposited them all the way along the river, but of course a lot of them also ended up behind Milltown Dam. In the flood of 1908, the Milltown Dam was under 14 feet of water. The dam owner had to blow up a portion of the dam to protect the entire structure. In the ice jam of 1996, the dam's owner, Montana Power, was worried the dam wouldn't hold up. It was a close call. Operators were quick to lower the reservoir as a way to put the brakes on the ice and to keep it from striking the dam. That sent contaminated metals over the dam and into the river. It's clear that natural forces could send this reservoir mess downriver. This reservoir really does remind me of the story of the emperor's new clothes, because it appears to be one thing, but if you look more deeply underneath and see what it really is, it's a collection of sediments that cause damage to the groundwater and the river whenever there's high ice flows or, or high water. The contaminants are so well hidden, despite being 30 feet thick in places, that no one even knew there was a problem until 1981. That's when health officials discovered arsenic in several of Milltown's drinking wells. They eventually traced the problem to the Milltown Reservoir and Butte's legacy of mining in the headwaters of the Clark Fork River. After scientists made the connection between the poisoned wells and the reservoir, it didn't take them long to realize that arsenic was just the tip of the iceberg in Milltown. The metals that we're most worried about are cadmium, copper, and zinc. And for aquatic life, we worry about the metals in the sediments when they're resuspended um, in the water during flood events, during ice scour events, such as we saw in 1996. Those events have resulted in some fish kills and toxicity to you know, fish below the dam. Because these metals can be extremely dangerous to human health and aquatic life, the EPA declared Milltown Reservoir and hundreds of adjacent acres a toxic waste site under federal Superfund law. Eventually, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, designated Superfund sites upstream too. The dam itself became the endpoint of a 120-mile Superfund complex, the largest in the country. The real danger at Milltown is that its poisons don't sit still. Arsenic has spread well beyond Milltown Reservoir's boundaries, and there's no telling where it could go next. As for copper and other metals, the only certainty is they, too, will continue to pollute the Clark Fork River. As long as we have sediments contaminated with arsenic in the reservoir, we will have contamination of the Milltown water supply, and it will not clean itself up. Well, we always think of a dam as holding back sediments, but in the case of Milltown, the reservoir is really full to capacity with sediment. That means that new sediment that comes down the river is no longer really stored in the river, so it doesn't really hold back sediment anymore. Flooding on the Clark Fork happens. It's natural, it's expected, it's how rivers work. What is not natural and what is not safe is the presence of tons of toxic waste sitting in the Clark Fork's river bottom right next to an aging dam. To address the dam's structural shortcomings, the federal agency overseeing hydroelectric dams in the United States recently reclassified Milltown as a high hazard and ordered substantial reinforcements to its structure. And leaks were recently discovered. The trouble is, if the reservoir's toxic waste are allowed to continue to plug the river, then Milltown Dam is going to require top-notch maintenance, care, and attention forever. And it's an old dam. It needs substantial um, upgrades in order to 
you know, continue to, to be safe. Um, and it seems to me that it's lived its useful life, and the best thing to do is to remove it. Equally troubling, perpetual maintenance won't take care of the dam's fish problems. After guiding and fishing on the Clark Fork River for the past decade, I'm convinced that there's the single most important thing that we could do to improve the fishery is to remove Milltown Dam that blocks the confluence of the Clark Fork and the Blackfoot. And that's what needs to happen. It needs to happen soon. Trout populations in the Clark Fork are a fraction of what they should be. Biologists pin the blame on the presence of metals and dams. The dam at Milltown is the first of four on the Clark Fork, and it prevents fish from traveling upstream and reaching hundreds of miles of spawning habitat in the Blackfoot, Rock Creek, and Flint Creek. Another big problem with the reservoir now, just in the last four years, is the identification of pike in the reservoir. And the pike are a non-native species to Montana, and these non-native species are eating all the trout, the cutthroats and the bull trout, and the bull trout is an endangered species, so it's, a, it's very important that we try to correct that problem before we lose that resource. To make the situation even worse, these fish stack up at the dam during spring runoff, when toxic metals typically spill over the dam. For years, Milltown Dam has been a money loser for its owners. It generates less than two megawatts of power, a mere one-tenth of one percent of Montana's needs. We also know it's more expensive to uh, keep the dam in place and repair it than it is to remove it. So it seems pretty common sense to me that it's going to come out someday. We better figure out how to do it right and get it done. The surge in interest in dam removal, both nationally and locally, is beginning to produce a growing body of knowledge and expertise about how to do it, how to do it safely, and how to do it effectively. The Edwards Dam, which was pulled out of the Kennebec River in Maine in 1999, is a useful model for Milltown. It's about the same size as Milltown and also blocked several species of fish. Today, the Kennebec fishery is well on its way again, and towns along the river are experiencing new recreational and business opportunities. Initially, the city was opposed. Uh, the dam represented uh, uh, the economic lifeblood of the city for 100 years. So uh, naturally, there was a sense that uh, it was not a good thing to remove this dam. I think the dam removal was the catalyst which led to some new monies coming in, which led to some new business interests. I think it's all intricately connected. The one thing that distinguishes dam removal at Milltown from dam removal on the Kennebec is the toxic waste sitting in the reservoir. The waste will have to be removed and safely stored in a repository before any dam dismantling gets underway. ARCO, recently purchased by BP Amico, has the responsibility of paying for the cleanup. It's a big job, but feasible. From the EPA perspective, we believe it's safe to physically remove the sediments from behind the dam without causing unacceptable degradation of the Clark Fork below the dam. Cleanup and dam removal is going to cost anywhere from 100 to 150 million dollars, which is going to create all sorts of new jobs and economic benefits in restoring a vital asset to the Missoula community. I think uh, clean water, uh, high paying jobs uh, would make it just obviously a win win situation for the whole community. The possibility of waste removal and dam removal at the Milltown Superfund site is gaining both public attention and public support. The Superfund process is approaching decision time. A dam licensing determination is around the corner, and communities both upstream and down are increasingly turning towards bold approaches to lingering water quality problems. This region played a vitally important role in history. It gave the world copper but it also heaped a lot of abuse on the Clark Fork River Basin. Now we have the chance to revitalize our river, to take a positive step to make amends. By voicing support for sediment and dam removal, you can help make this a century of restoration.
Well, people were really vehement about not removing the dam, particularly the neighbors in the hill just up this way that overlooks the park. They felt that they were going to be losing an asset to their neighborhood. They were concerned that it was just going to be a mud hole, that there would be mosquitoes, that there would be whatever that was unattractive here. People at first were very, very skeptical of uh, what was going to happen. But of course now, uh, people know very well what's happened and, and the whole city is enjoying it. Since the 1700s, people have built dams to provide power for our growing nation. We relied on these dams for everything from irrigating our fields, to powering our lumber and grain mills, to manufacturing our clothing. In fact, we have built on average more than one dam every day since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Today, most of the mills are gone, but the dams remain. And while many dams continue to serve important purposes, there are thousands of obsolete dams, or dams that simply cause more harm than good. These dams block our waterways across the United States, putting a financial burden on the owners and harming the health of our rivers. Many communities are learning that maintaining a questionable dam is not in their best interest that removing a dam and gaining a healthy, free-flowing river is actually a key asset for their future. Back in the late 50s, early 60s, I think it was commonplace when businesses didn't know what to do with the dam or want to give it up. They went to the local community and said, geez, we're going to give you this wonderful dam and to make it legal, we'll charge you a dollar for it, give us the dollar, and now the dam is your responsibility. 1981, uh, we received a notice from the Department of Natural Resources that we had several problems. The average lifespan of a dam is about 50 years, and only regular maintenance and expensive repair can extend a dam's life. Many dams have gone neglected, and by the year 2020, the vast majority of our dams will be older than 50 years. This is a problem many communities can no longer afford to ignore. So what can we do when we're faced with an unsafe or obsolete dam, or one that simply causes more harm than good? Typically, there are three options. Change how the dam is operated, repair it, or remove it. We'll take a look at three communities that removed a dam when faced with this decision. South Lake Tahoe, California, Augusta, Maine, and West Bend, Wisconsin. What were their concerns? What did they gain? And most importantly, what's their advice? Well, as I recall, we were concerned about uh, that probably was nothing but mud and muck underneath, and it was not going to be something that would ever be able to be used, and it would end up being a real eyesore. Uh, they were also concerned as to who was going to take care of it and how it was going to be taken care of. So I think a lot of people were concerned about what would happen with and what the looks would be once all of a sudden we saw a mud flat piece of land uh, right in the middle of our city. I think the most important thing is to have an alternative for people to look at. What will the area be like without the dam? Will it be an asset to the community? Will it be an asset to my property if I'm a neighborhood? You've got to have that alternative vision. Together, the city and the community developed a plan for how the new land would be restored. This process helped people envision what the area would look like once the dam was removed. One thing, though, I, I need to say, though, as well, is in this conservative community, cost was a significant issue. To replace the dam with a combined dam and bridge would have been $3.3 .3 million. And you look at $86,000 to take out the dam, plus some work to develop a park, another $200,000 to get it seated, and then continuing investments in park facilities that people could enjoy. Which are you going to get more for your money from? And when they began to weigh that, 
the dam and bridge combination versus no dam and a park, it became clear that the balance was in favor of putting the money in a park. Dam removal can be the logical choice for budget-conscious communities. Often repairs are more than three times as expensive as the one-time cost of removing a dam. And replacing the dam is usually even more expensive. So we saved a million eight hundred thousand dollars by not replacing the dam. And we gained all of the land that was in the impoundment area, which was well over 67 acres of land that is now usable, that wasn't usable before. The area that was underwater uh, when the dam was in yet was extended all the way around onto this side here, that walkway there, all the way west to Indiana Avenue, which is a large area. While residents today can enjoy a healthy, free-flowing Milwaukee River, one that includes fishing, recreation, and clean water, when the dam was in place, it was a different story. Well, we live just on the other side of the woods over there and um, in a new subdivision down where the dam used to be. It was nothing but a just a big cesspool. People had tires in there and refrigerators and just it was really nasty and it smelled horribly. It was bad news. Not until the dam was removed did everyone realize that they had turned bad news and a liability into good news and an asset for the whole community. They did a wonderful job. I mean, it really made something out of nothing almost, <laughs> out of garbage. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And all the prairie flowers that are coming up and um, all the rabbits that are hopping along <laughs> on the trails. What more would you want to see in nature? I caught a 13 and a half smallmouth bass over there. All right. Have fun? Yep. It was your first cast, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing to me that we can be so blind to this wonderful asset for so many years. And I was part of it. And it, you know, you don't really realize what a wonderful thing having a river flowing through your town is. So now you say to me, what does that mean when you're in business? Well, I have to recruit people to come to this town to go to work, to come to this company. So then I can walk them down to our river and I can show them this beautiful river and kids fishing and public sculptures along the river. And I can take them to our cultural district, which is not too far from the river, and show them those things. And it's a big selling point in recruiting people to come to work for this company and in keeping them. Oh. Getting rid of the dam and letting Letting the water go through and, and uh, improving the park this way, it's, it's generally, it's a lot more useful. It's a lot more usable to, to people. There's, with the trails, it's real nice and stuff. And obviously, my boys love the bridges. So the whole attitude has changed. And now people want to be down, not only setting along the river, walking along the river, but they also want to even be experiencing and touching the river. And so it really is a nice benefit for the public to have. The city purchased about 50 acres out there in this dam and the lake. Lake Christopher was part of that. It was a man-made lake that had been created for the subdivision. And so the city acquired it in hopes of creating a recreation area, a sailing-type lake, something like that. And then soon thereafter, the Bureau of Dam Safety, state of California, declared the dam unsafe. They went from a potential revenue source to a, a maintenance problem, right? So it was a bad decision, but <laughs> looked like a good decision when originally purchased, but then in the end it turned out to be a, well, in the final outcome it ended up being a pretty good, because we do have a nice restored meadow in this area now. I think that the Lake Christopher restoration project was probably a project that no one would have had any logical opposition to. It was um, getting rid of a dam that for years had not held back any water. There had been a couple of unsuccessful attempts at uh, fixing it. And I, but I think that if the public information process had started out the way it has on other projects in Tahoe, uh, everything would have gone smoothly. Oh, the change, the difference in change, just that things were changing. Um, 
around you and feeling somewhat powerless. Success or failure can hinge on the public's understanding and support. In South Lake Tahoe, public education about the plan to remove the dam and to restore Coal Creek did not begin early enough. The project came to a halt when residents found out that trees needed to be cut and that the diversion ditch enjoyed by the neighbors had to be relocated. Coal Creek was, it was put in a, in a ditch on the far side of the lake and was very linear, confined channel that could not overtop its banks and flood the meadow and deposit sediment in the meadow as streams do naturally. Uh, essentially, it was a pipeline of sediment moving downstream into Lake Tahoe. Dams interrupt the natural balanced flow of sediment. This can cause entire watersheds down to the coastal areas to be sediment starved while others, such as Lake Tahoe, are overloaded. Restoring streams like Cold Creek helps distribute sediment naturally throughout the whole watershed. Through numerous public hearings and site walks, citizens were able to get the facts and have their concerns addressed. After almost a year of delay, public trust was reestablished and the project was able to move forward. Usually, dam removal does not require extensive engineering. Nature will take care of itself. But there are cases where the landscape is so disturbed that intensive stream restoration is needed, like Cold Creek. This is the site as it, as it looked in 1987, right after the dam was drained out. The dam was located across the narrow part of the valley here and this picture was taken standing on the dam as it was draining. After the dam was removed, the old diversion ditch was filled and a new stream bed was created so that Cold Creek could once again meander through the meadow. Instead of piping sediment out to the lake, we're putting water back on the land, we're rewatering the meadow, we're growing vegetation, we're depositing sediment where it belongs on the land, not in the water. Um, so we're helping Lake Tahoe. We're restoring fisheries. We're restoring wildlife habitat, like waterfowl habitat. They, they, I think it's 75% of the wetlands and 50% of the meadows in urban areas around the Tile Basin have been destroyed or altered. And so a project like this is a very significant step in bringing back some of that lost habitat. Now that the project's completed and it's been stable for several years and has uh, performed in every way that like the Conservancy suggested and proposed it would perform. I'm kind of embarrassed that I was ever opposed to stream restoration, um, but it took an educational process. You know, you really have to think about what you're gonna hand down to your children. Restoring something to its natural beauty, I think is something that people will never regret. Uh, we're pounding in willow sticks and they'll sprout out and they'll grow to be full-size willow bushes and then it gives a protection to the, the fish that will eventually be in here and really it just it doesn't take that much time and it, it, it for the time it takes it helps so much more. Uh, it, actually, we wouldn't be able to do this trip if they hadn't removed the dam. Yeah, it's, been water. it's the first time in 160 years that the w river's been open all the way to Augusta. Right. So, oh. and, and the other day we kayaked from, um, from Fort Halifax to here, and we could see fish. And we, we kept seeing all these ripples. And, all, and the next day we read in the paper how there were huge fish all of a sudden making their way up to Winslow. So my, my daughter wasn't too keen on the idea that she had been seeing real fish. But <laughs> The Kennebec River in Maine was once one of the nation's most productive fisheries. Ten species of fish inhabited the river, including thriving runs of sturgeon, shad, and Atlantic salmon. In 1837, the Edwards Dam was built to provide mechanical power and later electrical power for sawmills, a grist mill, and a textile mill. The dam helped fuel the Industrial Revolution, over time, the mills closed and other power sources were built. And in July 1999, the Edwards Dam was removed in order to bring back the historic fish populations that long ago inhabited the river in record numbers. 
After 12 years of debate, change is happening quickly on the Kennebec River. It's, a, it's amazing how fast the rivers are covering. You know, grass and trees are growing on the banks, and it's already looking more natural than it did before they took it out. Weeks after Dan was fishing out, I saw stripers up here, literally weeks. And I think no one believed me at first until somebody actually hooked on to one, then they put in the paper, and then it was kind of believable. So, uh, so we're encouraged. You know, we've seen pretty much uh, most of the migratory fish species that historically utilize the habitat. We have seen uh, American shad, fairly large numbers of river herring, and sturgeon, and uh, rainbow smelt, uh, American eel and uh, striped bass. They are moving past Augusta, where the old Edwards Dam was. And we also had uh, one sighting of an Atlantic salmon that, that uh, leapt out of the water up near Waterville. Didn't want it to happen. Uh, didn't think there'd be any water left. I thought I had a piece of property that was real nice that was going to end up being not so nice. And As in every community, people had concerns about the unknown. The positive changes are taking people by surprise, even turning ardent opponents into supporters. Just the opposite. My water stayed the same. More fishing, more uses of the river. It definitely improved and I had to eat some crow. I didn't think it was going to, but it did. So. And I think if you give everything a chance, nature will straighten itself out, but you've got to give it a chance. Nature got its chance when citizens, natural resource agencies, anglers, conservation groups, and the state government finally agreed that a restored, free-flowing Kennebec River was more valuable than the small amount of electric power generated by the dam. We finally concluded that uh, the best result was to remove the dam and that given the fact that the license was, uh, was coming up to be renewed and there was very little electricity being generated, that it really made more sense to do it the right way and to just remove the dam. That's why we don't have uh, indefinite licenses to run dams. And so we can take that, uh, that second look at various times in our history and see whether or not the dam is continuing to serve the purpose that uh, it was originally granted the license for. The Edwards Dam, like most hydroelectric dams, was regulated and licensed by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. When the Edwards Dam 30-year license was up for renewal, citizens of Maine lobbied FERC, saying that only by removing the dam would they bring back the historic fishery and enjoy the many benefits of a free-flowing Kennebec River. FERC finally agreed in 1998 and ordered the Edwards Dam to be removed. This was the first time they denied a license renewal and ordered the removal of an operating dam. There was a minimal environmental impact. Uh, we had no complaints whatsoever. All the governing bodies were very pleased and uh, I think the project went extremely well. The dam was 917 feet long. It was 140 feet wide. So I felt a little bit sad even ripping it apart, but now when I come back, uh, I look out here, I watch these sturgeon, I know where the hole is, where they jump out of the water, and uh, it's beautiful. But definitely when it started, I, I was a little bit, you know, is this the right thing? But today, I guess I feel that it was the right thing to do. More people can use it for, you know, a wider variety of things now, and I certainly don't miss it, you know. I'm sure it had its purpose, but we're happy without it. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, the kids will take it up and, and continue the same sort of crusade-like to keep the rivers clean and bring the fish back, and hopefully they'll you know, see more bountiful runs than we ever will see in our lifetime. We never thought that we'd ever see the dam go out. So this is a bonus, a real bonus. Initially, the city was opposed. Uh, the dam represented uh, uh, 
the economic lifeblood of the city for a hundred years. Generations of people had come to Augusta to work in the mills and in the industries and commercial enterprises that sprang up as a consequence of the mill. So uh, naturally there was a sense that uh, it was not a good thing to remove this dam. Within a very short time, people in Maine began to see that restoring free-flowing rivers by removing a dam also brings new options for economic revitalization. As in West Bend and other communities, the restored Kennebec River is a new economic force. I think the dam removal was the catalyst for the enhanced city-state relationship, which led to some new monies coming in, which led to some new business interests. I think it's all intricately connected. Uh, we've had several out-of-town developers step up to the plate and buy buildings in the downtown area. We're looking right across at a couple of them that uh, uh, one very well-respected Portland developer has acquired and has told me the reason he acquired them was because he thinks that this is potentially the next upscale old port development. The old port in Portland, Maine is, uh, is, a, is a very successful commercial revitalization effort. And he thinks that that's, that's this place five or six years down the road. Dams can provide important services, but these services come at a cost. The people of West Bend, South Lake Tahoe, Augusta, and many other communities have learned that despite their initial fears, dam removal can be affordable. It increases their quality of life, benefits the environment, and expands their economic opportunities. They found that taking a second look at their dams is an important part of planning their future. Removing contaminated sediments from Wisconsin's waterways is an important part of the effort to clean up a legacy of pollution. Contaminants attached to sediments are left over from an era of discharging industrial waste and raw sewage directly into our lakes, rivers, and streams. It's become clear that the problem will not go away on its own. In fact, ignoring these contaminants could jeopardize the recovery of our waterways, both ecologically and economically. To combat the problem, environmental professionals have worked for decades to refine dredging methods that will safely remove tainted sediments. Dredging has a variety of uses on waterways. Bridge and pipeline construction, mining, navigation, recreation, and environmental cleanups. Selecting a dredging technology depends upon the purpose of the project. Environmental dredging is an effective way to remove contaminated sediments from rivers. It prevents the sediments from being stirred up and spread through the waterway with the currents. Environmental dredging is a proven technology. Thousands of projects have been done throughout the world using this technique. Here's one of them. The Manistique River and Harbor is about 150 miles north of Green Bay in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. A paper mill there had released polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, into the waterway as a byproduct of their manufacturing process. PCBs are a chemical compound that have been known to cause health risks to members of the food chain. Although the Environmental Protection Agency banned their manufacture in 1979, 
PCBs don't break down in the environment and can linger in sediments for years. Such was the case in Manistique Harbor. So, in 1996, EPA began using a type of environmental dredge to remove 120,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment. That's equal to about 9,000 dump truck loads. This is the hydraulic dredge they used. It has a horizontal auger with intake pipes located behind the cutter head. The cutter head is sunk to about 20 feet underwater. It loosens compacted sediments so that the suction pipes can't collect them, similar to the way a snowblower works. Using a powerful pump that works like a vacuum cleaner, all of the contaminated sediments are sucked up and deposited in containers on the surface. Notice how clear the water is around the cutter head. The suction pipes are collecting all of the sediments. Monitoring around the dredge showed that this operation did not stir up any of the sediments in the water. The mixture of water and sediment, called a slurry, is pumped through a discharge pipeline to a barge, which carries the sediments to a temporary settling basin on shore. First, the sediment is placed in a settling lagoon to begin removing the water. An on-site treatment facility uses sand filters, seen in the foreground, and carbon filters, the larger columns in the rear, to carefully process the millions of gallons of water that are collected during the dredging. After treatment, water is then returned to the harbor free of contaminants. Once the water is squeezed out of these sediments by these mechanical presses, they're ready for disposal in a landfill that's designed specifically to receive PCB sediments. Manistique is one of many examples showing how environmental dredging can effectively remove PCBs from our waterways. After dredging, monitoring data confirms significant improvements to water quality. These results in Manistique are encouraging since the conditions there are similar to those in some of Wisconsin's waterways, including the lower Fox River. The Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has been tracking sediment cleanups and technologies for many years to ensure the best techniques are used to manage environmental cleanups on our waterways. We've successfully used innovative technologies to remove contaminants and streams throughout the state. Wisconsin has plans to use environmental dredging techniques on two portions of the lower Fox that have elevated levels of PCB contamination. The information gained from these projects will help us advance our restoration of waterways that have been harmed by contaminated sediments. In 1999, the department completed a cleanup of an area of the Fox River near Little Chute, shown here as Deposit N. Dredging at a second site, Sediment Management Unit 5657, was begun in August of 1999 and is still underway. Both cleanup projects used environmental dredging technologies similar to those shown in our Manistique, Michigan example. A dredge removes sediment from the riverbed and pumps it in a water slurry to a treatment site on shore. There the mixture is separated. The water is treated and returned to the river while the dried sediment is taken to a landfill for disposal. This is the dredge used at deposit end. It is a swing ladder cutter head dredge built for dredging contaminated sediment. The cutter head rotates to break up and dislodge sediment from the riverbed, and the suction intake pulls the sediment into the intake pipe for pumping to the onshore treatment site. Under the water, the rotating cutter head looks like this. Watch as it scoops up the contaminated sediment and debris from the river bottom, vacuuming material immediately into the intake pipe, leaving the water around the work very clear. At the treatment site, mechanical presses squeeze the water from the sediment. The dense, compacted product that is finally produced is called filter cake. The white flecks on the cake are a type of sand that's used to speed up the drying process. Deposit N was completed in October, ahead of schedule and under budget. The savings were applied to begin cleanup of an adjacent site at Deposit O. In the past year, 8,500 yards of sediment containing 110 pounds of PCBs have been taken from the river. In comparison, 60 to 80,000 cubic yards of river sediment are targeted for removal at Sediment Management Unit 5657. In partnership with local and federal agencies, Wisconsin continues to be a leader in environmental management, using the best technologies available to restore our waterways.